Uh, so uh, we're going to have a quick discussion about some of the things we've seen uh, over the course of the two days and w where we think things might go in the near future. And to do that, I'd like to invite uh, two panellists, uh, Libby and Noor, back to the stage. I think they've both spoken at certain points uh, during the last couple of days. Um, so maybe for given that some people have only come for day two, etc., uh, let's just recap, say, uh, in Scylla Black style, you know, what's your name and where do you come from? <laughs> um, hi, I'm Libby Kinsey from Project Juno. Um, where did I come from? I spent um, just over a decade investing in um, physical science and computer science startups here in the UK. And about five or six years ago, decided I wanted to do machine learning. So I went back to UCL, in fact, to do the machine learning masters. Um, and for about two days after graduating from that, I felt super powered. And then I realized that I had no idea to actually turn machine learning into valuable products and services. I didn't have any of the DevOps or infrastructure skill sets at all. And it seemed like a lot of the companies that I was talking to, to join, didn't know those things either. So this conference has is kind of really at the centre of the sorts of things that I'm interested in. How do you turn machine learning into valuable products and services? And what's the environment like? What are the societal impacts um, that might uh, impact how you try to do that? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm Noor Shaker. I'm originally Syrian. I did a bachelor in computer science engineering uh, back in Syria and then moved to Belgium. Leuven did a master in AI. And from there, I started my academic career. I moved to Copenhagen in Denmark. I spent about eight, nine years doing PhD, postdoc, started my assistant professorship in, at Aalborg University in Copenhagen. I was mainly doing AI, machine learning for um, generative models, not, well, GANs and deep learning models were really popular at the time. So I was doing mainly genetic algorithms, neural networks, and combination of both. Um, I was mainly interested in what a field called procedural content generation, which basically means um, GANs or like generative models, but the, the kind of the, the old style. Uh, I was doing that for games, and I was particularly interested in understanding user behavior and coming up with content or with like particular pieces of new new games, new levels that meet that behavior automatically. So like kind of closing the, the, called the effective looping game, basically sensing emotions, feeding that into a model that can come up with new content and then let the player play and kind of like this kind of loop. So I spent quite a lot of time doing that kind of research. And then as I enter the, the professorship word, I, I kind of looked into the future of the of like my career path, and I thought uh, there's still like a lot of things that I can do that I enjoy really doing, and I can do it a um, bit faster and be more productive if I am not in research. So I decided to leave academia. I moved to to London, March last year. Joined Entrepreneur First and started my entrepreneurial path. I met my co-founder, who is, has a physics background, and we started GTN. And I've been working on GTN for the past nine months as um, a chief exec. Maybe just say a little, very short yeah, what, the, what the company does. Yeah. yeah, so GTN stands for Generative Tensorial Networks, and the idea is that by combining, by building like interdisciplinary innovation, we can provide really, really good insights and way more efficient way of doing drug discovery. And by that I mean like opening up a new space of chemicals that are unseen or unreachable before. So going beyond what humans have seen throughout the humanities and opening up a new, new totally new space of chemicals that could become drug, making the whole process of drug, kind of like disrupting the whole process of drug discovery by just opening up new possibilities. Uh, very good. I think I think we'll, the, the format is we'll just, uh, we'll sort of set this up for 10 minutes or so and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. So get thinking. Uh, we'll be asking for a show of hands in short order. Uh, where we think, if we think a little bit about what we've seen, you, you brought up the point about the kind of DevOps and actually how to roll some of this out in practice. Um, where do you think we are in that adoption curve for companies? So we will have seen over the course of the two days a variety of different applications 
um, you know, everything from uh, graphics through to you know, uh, time series in finance and things like that. Where, where do you think we are on that adoption curve for every company having some sort of machine learning enabled product? That's a mean question. <laughs> um, actually, surprisingly few um, AI uh, enabled products and services at the moment actually use machine learning, and even fewer deep learning. So there was a McKinsey report last year which um, surveyed lots and lots of corporates and asked them whether they were uh, deploying anything or whether they were thinking about it. And it was, it was a small percentage, although I can't remember exactly what it was. Um, and I think that's partly because we are relatively early in the adoption cycle, particularly of deep learning. And um, those that have deployed in the real world tend to be the gaffers of the world, the, um, the social or search huge corporates, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple, who have access to very, very large amounts of data and um, large data centers in which to um, process it. Um, and that's kind of... Uh, has been beyond the expertise and um, money of, of resource of, of lots of, not, not even very small companies, small to medium ones as well. Um, if, if I think about the, the work you're doing in terms of Juno and the mapping, which, which sectors do you see uh, a proliferation of potential applications? You know, is there a leading yeah. sector? Well, well, part of the reason we did that is that um, we had seen a lot of noise made about um, ad tech, things like that. So, so the early adopters tended to be in those kind of spaces where e-commerce, for instance, where you might have a lot of data. And that kind of seemed a bit dull in terms of what you wanted to get up in the morning and do. So we wanted to, to me, maybe not to everybody. <laughs> um, so we wanted to shine a light on some of the other applications. And actually, they are myriad. Um, and there's lots happening in all kinds of different spaces, but, but there are some where um, adoption has taken longer and perhaps um, manufacturing or the creative industries might fall into those categories. And that's probably, again, because of lack of data. When, when you, uh, Noor, when you were uh, joining EF, making a transition from gaming uh, into drug discovery, <laughs> uh, talk, talk me through the process of, of identifying that as a, a particular sort of target sector that you wanted to get into? Okay, so I don't really have like structure way of like how things went until we kind of tapped into drug discovery, but kind of like, the, it's kind of like fun story. We, I mean, just met my co-founder and we felt like together with like machine learning and quantum physics, we can do something really, really cool. And we could- it's, it's got a lot of good words. Yeah, it's like- <laughs> 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 yeah, okay, I go with just that. Say blockchain as well. Just, you know, we're just, <laughs> then we're there, we're done. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, so I feel like drug discovery is way more exciting, by the way. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, um, so we started like looking into different verticals and there are a number of them that sound really exciting and like has a lot of potential, but it just like we didn't really feel that the, the kind of the impact would be really great and like in terms of like a social impact, the benefit and like kind of signifying the use of the technology until we we kind of looked into drug discovery and the inefficiencies were really like it, it was like the whole thing was really shocking. The, the kind of like well, how it is right now, the expectation into the future, and kind of like and the fact that all of these inefficiencies and then the, by the end of the day, it's like people's life. It, it's it's really huge, and what 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 we had was kind of like the best fit to the to the field. So kind of like just decided that to go after it. In that sector where you where you do have very large, well financed companies that are in principle used to using data, why yeah. do, why do you think, uh, as as you see it at the moment, they they're behind uh, the curve? They're way in, in behind. Adoption? Yeah, they're way behind. I think the main reason for them to be behind is they they kind of not really a risk risk takers. So pharma has like lots of money, lots of data, but but they tend to minimize 
the risk or like the financial basically risk because the, the whole process is already very very risky with like 90 percent or more failing of the compounds failing later in the clinical process and you want to minimize that and taking more risk by trying something really novel really new is like will, will add to it so they recently like for the past probably five ten years they they started to kind of outsource a lot of a lot of the process, so they can put lots of money in different places and then try like to get people to do whatever they want to do with innovation and then take the one that that succeed, which is yeah make, I mean they they still fall behind but at least they will get to to kind of influence other people as well and you get access to the data you get access to to resources as well which is very good yeah. uh, depending on where we go I, I might go back down the rabbit hole of. Uh, sort of empirical testing uh, drug discovery. Yeah. Um, but let's leave that for a second. It's not necessarily a uh, medical audience. Um, j just before we open it up, maybe for a couple of questions, Libby, you've written uh, a couple of blog posts uh, that I have read about uh, the AI winter. Right, We're going through several different waves of um, machine learning and AI technologies, yeah. and we seem to make uh, accelerated progress uh, over a certain period of time and then we slow down and the adoption doesn't quite happen and the use cases don't quite materialise. Maybe you just say a little bit about how you see that happening. One, one, explain it for the audience that haven't read the blog and then maybe we could talk about this this third AI winter and whether <laughs> whether it'll uh, happen or not. Yeah, sure. So um, I was thinking about what might cause the current wave of... Um, confidence in machine learning products and services to, to have a, some kind of check, less investment. Um, uh, and the, the way that came about is I went to NIPS in 2016 and I was talking to a lot of people there and it seemed that, that some things were happening which on their own might not presage a, a kind of a bubble but together seemed to suggest that we're in a, at least something that's a little bit frothy. So for instance, um, the kind of investors that wouldn't normally take technology risk are coming into this space. So the Goldman Sachs of the world and sovereign wealth funds, that's that's kind of sometimes a little bit indicative of something a bit bubbly. Um, and the kind of salaries now that startups are having to pay for talent. I mean, there's, there's just such a lot of competition for talent in the space. So what does that mean? That kind of means that um, innovation is getting more expensive and investors... If, if it is a venture-backed startup, may not get the returns that they need. So another another kind of anecdotal piece of in, information from that conference was that some of the large corporates that had been very active in acquiring were having real trouble actually deriving value from the startups that they'd acquired. Um, and the other side of things was around um, the societal implications and the perception of AI. And um, I guess it's perhaps there that that things have moved on even in the last year, the sense that there are becoming haves and have-nots um, that uh, are being entrenched because of access to machine learning technologies um, and that, that, that biases may become entrenched if, the, if we don't take um, some, of, some of the ethics seriously. Um, and the fear of job losses. So, so I'm not even talking about fear about, of singularity. These are much, much more kind of concrete fears and I think they are justified. So there's a lot still to do to make sure that we develop um, machine learning products and services that uh, the public continues to think on balance are good for them and that we can continue to build at a cost which makes it worth investing. If we don't do those two things then I think there could be a winter. But I'm not saying there's going to be, I'm a massive optimist. <laughs> All right, we'll, t we'll take questions in a couple of minutes. Maybe, Nora, just uh, before we sort of throw things open to the floor, um, comment a little bit about whether you, you see some of the technologies that you've been working in in that industry displacing jobs. You've talked about inefficiencies in drug discovery pipeline. Uh, I know I don't know enough about the industry to understand what the consequences or knock-on effect of automating various parts of that would be. Where do, where do you think this will go? So I think AI is kind of like what do you call it, like two-faced sword or something? <laughs> like a sword with like two double-edged sword. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's basically, I mean, for us at least, so the way we see it is that we are improving the efficiencies of drug discovery, which basically means that 
in, in some way we are taking some of the, the job that chemists would usually do and automate it, which basically means that we are like some of the chemists will, will lose their job. But if you look at the other side, what, what does that mean? Is because because we're increasing the efficiencies of the whole of the whole process, we are also in reducing the amount of money you have to spend on drug discovery. And what that means is that probably in like 10 to 15 years time, it's not going to be limited to only pharmaceutical companies to be able to, to fund the whole process. They're going to be like more medium-sized startups, medium-sized companies being able, because the, the kind of the whole process is reduced, the amount of money you have to spend is reduced, will be able to afford the whole thing. So it's kind of like taking jobs from some areas, but opening up other opportunities in other areas. So you need to, to look at the whole picture in, in, in one way or another. And the other thing that I, I really I really think like I really like to think about AI in a positive way. And I really like the idea that humans are really creative individuals. So if 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 you give them like a bit of freedom in time, they will figure something out and they will use it wisely in a way. It's just like building this culture around you I mean it, it's okay to less to work less amount of hours per day and just be creative in the in the the rest of your day. Uh, yeah, so we're all going to have long holidays. Sounds good. Yeah, which, yeah, is, no. which is great, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess if you look back through uh, human history, obviously for uh, the majority of it, we didn't uh, clock on and clock off <laughs> on a nine to five. So, um, Any questions from the audience in terms of things we've seen, transitions, uh, trends in the, in the space? Otherwise, you'll just have to listen to me talk. Which, which I'm okay with, but <laughs> yes. Um, we got a floor mic anywhere? I'll, I'll roam. I'll roam. Look at that. Don't say I don't work for my supper. Um, one thing, obviously, it's very uh, apparent in this conference is how many uh, actually very good uh, presentations have been done by the likes of Google and Amazon, etc., and how they're trying to position themselves to be enablers. But there's obviously, obviously, a bit of a tension there double-edged sword again between how much of the space is going to be us servicing the gaffers and how much can, where is the opportunity for new startups and others to actually take them on? So where, what's your view on, on this, the relationship between startups, developers and basically the gaffers? So my take on this is like, so these big giant companies tend to do things that are kind of like, they tend to care a lot about how big the market is and like the, how big the, the market and the product and these kind of things. The nice thing about startups and why I think most of them work, like work and have like potential is because we tend to like be really, really focused on like solving specific problems and solving it in a way that is like really innovative and really, really fast, which is something that you can't really do in big corporate because of like the hierarchy of decision making, because of like how, how they work in general, because of like the difficulty in collaboration. So if you're building like something similar to what we're building with GTN, like bringing people from like chemistry or physics and machine learning together and putting them to work together, it's, it's really, really challenging. And I feel it, it does work because we're still small, we're still agile, and we can like really move quickly, figure out the problems, and try to solve them very quickly. I can't really imagine such an interdisciplinary setting would work really well, either in Big Pharma or in Google or in Amazon or somewhere else. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, the whole thing that Forward Partners was talking about yesterday about... Um, looking at verticals where you need domain experience. Um, and that might come from having access to proprietary data that those organizations wouldn't have in that vertical. Or um, incre it's becoming increasingly important to think about um, knowledge representation and non-data um, approaches to, to intelligence. So the kind of expertise that you need to build that, th those priors into your, into your models. Um, those are probably areas where the large corporates don't have any interest or skills to go into. And then it's a positive that they're putting all of this amazing um, infrastructure and expertise out there for use by everyone. I think the only reason they can do that is that um, we, 
machine learning is being done in an unprecedentedly open way. All of the algorithms are available, the model zoos, uh, the research is happening um, very in a very open way. And it's being done that way because the value is in the data. So, so Baidu and Google release their research because they hold the data for their application areas. But if you can find other application areas, then you've got all of these great resources to use. Another question? Yeah. Just anecdotally uh, on John's point, I think uh, AlphaGo uh, costs £10 million in electricity for training, right? So there's a definite yeah. things that a startup can do and things that, yeah, they can't. I was just wondering if you could comment on, as you said, these big firms have an advantage in the data that they've gathered over so many years, but we're now seeing customers are able to go to these firms and pull all of their data. So if millions and millions of customers pulled all of their data and somebody else come along and said, give me your data, you could recreate a Google search engine, a Facebook, a Maps, pretty much anything that you wanted. What, what, do you see that potentially happening? I wonder how that would happen in the real world. Um, so, there's Azim Azar's got a really nice phrase for this, which I forget. But they, the 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 dominance of companies like Google um, is is only growing, in fact, because the products and services they provide are so sticky. People are using them more, and then they're collecting more data, and they can provide better products and services. So, I guess a kind of virtuous circle. He would say it in a much more fluent way, um, and it, I just can't. I, I kind of can see theoretically what you're saying, but I just can't imagine it working in practice. On the other hand, I do see that um, innovations in how one takes control of one's data and potentially gets some reward for sharing it with products and services that they want to use. I think that's a really interesting sort of area of opportunity, and, and um, starting to see lots of startups thinking about that. I think there'll be a combination of regulation and these kind of business model innovations that will give us back some control of our data. I hope so, anyway. Any further comments? That was another really difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we've had a couple of sessions on uh, GDPR-related activity. Um, I think the too, uh, too long didn't read version of that is, uh, you know, I think we have to wait and see how it's interpreted by the courts. Uh, right to forget is unlikely to generate the instant exodus of vast amounts of data from companies, yeah, but we shall see. Uh, anyone else? Someone at the back? Uh, maybe I'll ask a, uh, again another slightly unfair question. If, if we've gone through uh, waves of uh, uh, different algorithms for the sake of argument, um, and we're in the current one where you know the the uh, uh, recent successes of uh, revisiting neural networks with with vast computational power compared to what was uh, around when they were uh, originally invented. Uh, again, another sort of anecdotal uh, piece of information. I think the architecture for AlexNet, like one of the big first networks, um, if you were doing it in the in kind of 93 or 92 when it first came around, I think uh, they calculated it would take 250,000 years to train. <laughs> um, so one thing we've definitely seen in terms of uh, the availability to compute is like certain types of experiments uh, and therefore progress on certain types of uh, machines just wasn't really possible uh, over the last couple of decades. And now, you know, not just from the individual uh, architectures or machines themselves, but the, the difficulty of running a, an experiment that takes a long period of time and the difficulty of holding together research teams uh, over a, a few years in terms of uh, dedicated groups of people. And suddenly we've got to the point where actually you can start to make a reasonable amount of progress on quite large architectures. I wondered whether, you know, given that's the, that's the wave of success we're currently in, whether you, <coughs> uh, things like, pardon me, uh, you know, uh, symbolic uh, reasoning and other sorts of things which are now you know untrendy yeah. and where we seem to be making less progress things like grammars uh, things like the structure of priors um, whether you think we, we will get to the point where this this current wave is sort of run out of ideas and we have to revisit some of these other areas of computer science in more detail 
But we already are. I think this is really f fertile area. And um, so, for instance, you may have seen um, DeepMind hired Murray Shanahan from Imperial and hit one of a couple of his um, research students um, with a paper which was combining um, deep learning and symbolic reasoning. And they've they've been doing quite a lot of work in that. So trying to incorporate structure from the symbolic and relational sides to um, end-to-end -end deep learning approaches. Um, and there has been a little bit of a debate recently. I don't know if any of you follow, follow Gary Marcus on Twitter or have seen some of the debates at NIPS where he's been arguing that we need knowledge representations and structure and models to play a much bigger part in um, getting from perceptual reasoning to um, some of the higher level kind of uh, intelligence where you might want to, to um, well, I suppose reasoning being one of them. Um, I've lost my, th my thought <laughs> process. What are higher level cognitive things you might want to do? Yeah, that aren't, yeah. That aren't perceptual. <laughs> I would think like there's like two, like in my mind, there's probably two direction to, to answer the question. One of them is deep learning has been really cool and really like efficient and solved some of the really great problems in terms of classification, understanding text, uh, prediction or generation of images and text, but they're quite limited in a sense of like what kind of problem they can solve, how much data they need, so, and the expressiveness, so you can't really understand what's going on within the black box still. So like we, we're using a lot of deep learning in at GTN, but explaining the outcome to the to, to a chemist or like why this uh, drug structure is way more interesting or way more effective than the one you've been working with. How do we explain that? How do we explain how the, the method came up with that with that solution is something that we would be interested in at some point and I don't really have the answer about like how do we go about it yet. And the other thing is that there's like specific types of problems where deep learning hasn't really managed to do anything really interesting and those are the problems where you don't you either don't have enough data to train the models or the model or the problem is really really complicated and like multi-model kind of that you can't really do deep learning on it i my, like the, my my favorite example is emotion human emotion like how, how do we understand human emotion or cognitive affective states and so so far it's been like just about reading faces and understanding who is that but where, where do we get to the point where we, we're actually building emotional intelligence, where we can actually respond in a human way? This is something that we, I haven't really seen a lot of progress in, and I don't really think deep learning will be the solution. Oh, I don't know whether oh, I agree with that. Here we go. <laughs> you know so. I think um, emotion is, is one of those areas which is so difficult to have a formal definition around. Yes, I agree. It. I've I've worked a lot on that, yeah. and I work specifically on like building neural network to mathematically capture yeah. like engagement or fun, frustration, challenge when when players play a game, which is something you could imagine it won't work, but it worked up to a certain degree. So you can like predict actually how how engaged a human is when playing. Super Mario Bros, like 70% or like 80% accuracy. It might not be that really that accurate, but, that, but, but it is good enough. And I feel like there's a lot to be done within that area. It's just that it is so hard to, to like capture all the dimensionality of emotion, all the modalities that you can feed in the model. Yeah. So there's like not, not really a clear way about how, how do you go about it. I want to give an opportunity for an easier question. Yay. <laughs> so could I ask both of you about a new application in machine learning that you're particularly excited about or that you'd like to see move on more? Oh, that's a hard one. Oh, it I'm is, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was fun. <laughs> I tried. Do you want to go first? No. No. Um, I, I think some of the more interesting things um, are... Is shibboleth the right word? Things that, that we sort of, ideas we hold dear 
the idea that that creativity perhaps is is a is a really human um, domain, and I think that some of um, the machine learning um, innovations have started to make pe people feel a little bit uncomfortable there. So I'm interested to see where they go, and I think there are definitely business models which which can can walk a path which humans will be comfortable with as well. Um, over to, I've given you time to think. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like good. Um, so one of the, I mean, I tapped into like drug discovery very recently and I really love like the, the, the area. And the more I like think about it and the more I read about it, it's like you can see how, how much, how many problems are in there and like, like not specifically in drug discovery, but also in understanding human body and how it works and how do we get from like a disease up to a point up to a point where we can actually cure the disease with like all the computational, like, just imagine like that we have a way to kind of have a chemical and put it in a computationally created body and figure out all the complicated processes that goes in there and be able to predict very accurately whether it's gonna be an effective drug or not. We are like very, very far away from, from that. There are like some models like for like the kidney or the liver computational model to, to simulate those, but it's still far from actually having a fully comprehend model of the body and how it works. There's like the genome sequence project, which is like also something really exciting. And I feel like it's just that there are lots and lots and lots of problems within this field. And I feel like there's there are also lots of solutions. It's just that I'd really like to see people within different disciplines talking more to each other and figuring out problems. Uh, well, g given the, this is sort of associated with the School of Management and we've had talks from, uh, you know, infinite loops of drafts uh, uh, through to distributed architectures, I think that's a good place to end it. Uh, this is intended to be a conference that has a very broad uh, audience base uh, and explores a lot of different application areas. Uh, so maybe I'll just hand over to Louis to do last, last words. Thank you very much. Last words.